Okay, this is where it starts and ends. This is where life started. And right now we have life in our hands, our collective hands. Seven plus billion of us are destroying life on Earth. Now I'm going to try to cover a lot of material. And I'm going, if, if you don't walk out of here with a little bit of alarms and you weren't listening, the news media is not telling you all that you need to know. Your governments, all governments, are really hiding the depth of the truth about the climate problem that they are aware of. I'm going to add, before I leave it out, our universities are teaching incorrect information. Why are they continuing to teach incorrect information? Because everyone else is teaching the same information. And universities are very conservative organizations. This is the symbol of the organization that I, all of the work that I do on the internet, I do behind this symbol. I call my organization the United Planet Faith and Science Initiative. Here's my email address so that you can write me afterwards. Now, I put a title in my presentation today. I call it Ecology versus Economy in the Age of Catastrophic Climate Change. We are in the age of catastrophic climate change. Make no doubt about it. Usually over the month of April, the temperature will increase by perhaps 10 degrees Fahrenheit. It went up 20 degrees Fahrenheit between yesterday and today. This is all explainable if you understand the physics, but we are not being told why this is happening. Now, the faith part, I try to ally myself with those religious leaders who have much louder megaphones than I have. This is Pope Francis, very well loved around the world. My Catholics and non-Catholics, non-Christians, He's just a good man, a very spiritual, holy man, who is not afraid of telling the truth. The science part, I'm going to go on and present a few words from one of my mentors, Dr. James Hassan. He was the head of NASA's Goddard Institute in New York for 42 years until he quit saying that he could not sue the American government and work for the American government at the same time. The time had come to sue the government. He is actively pursuing a lawsuit against the American government for knowing how bad climate change is and not doing anything about it, or not doing enough about it. The ministers are coming here, or the heads of state, and they're planning to clap each other on the back and say, oh, we're really doing great. We're, this is a very successful conference. We're going to address the climate problem. Well, if that's what happens, then we're screwing the next generation and the following ones. Very strong words from a scientist. If that's what happens, we're screwing the next generation and the following ones. And that is what happened. They ministers clap one another on the back and said, we did great here. And the Paris Agreement was It was, let's just politely say, it was false. It was not enough to really solve the problem. It was posturing. Our governments are not protecting you. I say you, I will live to see some of it. You will, you will live to see things that you wish you hadn't seen. Now, the problem is huge, much greater than you imagine. I meet very few people who I cannot say Climate change is worse than you know it, and be telling the truth. Very few people know just how bad it is. It's part of the conspiracy of complacency by which the news media is not reporting on the worst effects. Governments obfuscate and delay, and they are held hostage by their need to meet the demands for an ever increasing GDP. If I had to name the curse of the planet, it's GDP. It's the fact that all governments think they have to grow. 
There is no more room for economic growth on this planet. That's a theme I will return to. Mainstream media leaves us just enough aware to know that something is wrong, but not enough to understand the magnitude of the problem or its consequences and how soon those consequences will come. Maybe they say, oh, Shanghai underwater, 2100. That is not the worst effect of climate change. We can retreat from lives and seas. Unless you seek out more information, you're left distracted by the story that society is telling itself. We are embedded in a story that we are telling ourselves with our media, with our advertising, with our movies. And that story is that everything will be okay if you just keep making money instead. Not. And our universities keep promoting the old, uneconomic ways of thinking. They call it economics. It's uneconomic. Now, the imperative is not saying, besides that, we in this room wake up and do our best to do all we can to wake our associates up, including our professors. I'm going to go into the only little bit of jargon, hopefully, that I'll deal with. This is RCP, is the initials, Representative Concentration Pathways, and it's UN speaking for the different paths that society may take in the climate crisis that's occurring. The RCPs are the differences between climate disruption, which we are already feeling, and climate chaos, which we are on the verge of unleashing. First, I'm going to let another scientist with higher authority than I on these matters, Dr. Matt Watson from the United Kingdom, speak about RCPs. Um, it's worth going through this a little bit. Jim Hayward made, made a point at a meeting recently that actually we should always start with this side because there's a question of why are we doing this? Why are we doing this research? This is why. This is the uh, latest um, projections from the uh, International Panel of, Panel of Climate Change. And the alarming thing, which again Sir Brian highlighted, is that these two scenarios actually explicitly include negative emissions technologies. So there is geoengineering of the flavour of carbon dioxide removal in the best case scenarios. The very, very alarming thing for us is that we are on this path here. That's AR 8.5. We are slap bang on this trajectory. And that puts us in, in, a, in, a, in a very, very different place in our children's or our grandchildren's lifetimes. Now, I would maintain that it's not our children or our grandchildren's lifetimes, it's in our lifetimes. Those two lowest scenarios are fiction. They are fiction. They cannot be achieved anymore. They depend upon massive amounts of the removal of a colorless, odorless gas from the atmosphere. And we do not have that technology. The only reason they keep those two lowest around is to give us a sense of comfort that maybe we can pull out of this. And they use that sense of, of comfort, essentially to mask the fact that they're still going for that high path. We're headed for four degrees. There's no way we can maintain two degrees. It's a fiction. So let's listen to another scientist. This is Dr. James Newman. He was mentioned by Matt Watson. The two of them worked together. He's in the University of Exeter in England, and he's a member of the Met Office, which is England's climate office. If we have a look at, uh, at what this temperature change actually is realised by uh, 2090, this is what it looks like in a geographical pattern. Now, um, I would say that there's some, some very interesting things here. Look at the scale. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, results from the Hadley Centre model, which is a, a reputable climate model. Um, the ice cap's gone up by 20 degrees. Okay? Bear that in mind. New York's gone up by eight. Okay? The Amazon's gone up by eight. And the Amazon's obviously a sensitive area for, um, because it's really acting as, as the lungs of the planet. It's often referred to because of its ability to pho uh, photosynthesize and take up carbon dioxide. 
So um, this, is, this is what the, that uh, four to five degree uh, temperature increase looks like. And this is where we're heading, unless we do anything. This is where we're heading, unless we do anything. And right now what governments are doing is completely inadequate. Now, I want to show you a little bit of what I feel is the gun going off. We've pointed a gun at our own heads, and the gun is going off. And this is where it's going off, in the Arctic. I'm not sure if you're aware of the Arctic methane problem. Methane is another colorless, odorless gas that is 80 to 90 times as powerful a greenhouse gas as CO2 averaged over a 20 year period. More intense than that in the first year or two, and over a 100 year period it goes down. But it's being emitted in the Arctic, which is the most sensitive area right now. Now, if you look on the left, that is the pattern of methane that was detected over the Arctic in November of 2008, and on the right, just four years later, in November of 2012. Now, let me point out the name in the lower corner, Dr. Ira Leifert, as we return to Dr. Leifert in just a moment. This is old data already. The methane release is not slowing down. Was this front page news? No. Is it critical information for us? Absolutely it is. There's this, again, complacency this conspiracy of complacency in the media. If it doesn't sell advertising, why publish it? There are exceptions, but mostly our news media are motivated by what will attract advertisers. Bad news about the climate doesn't attract advertisers. Now this is Dr. Ira Leifert. I want to show you a quote that he made in 2013, something he stated, and I'm breaking it up into three parts. Some scientists are indicating we should make plans to adapt to a four degree centigrade hotter world. While prudent, one wonders what portion of the population could adapt to such a world. My view is that it's just a few thousand people seeking refuge in the Arctic or Antarctica. Now, I showed this to someone yesterday and they said, well, that's an extreme statement. Yes, it's an extreme statement. But even if it is extreme, imagine what it would be like to go from, from 7 billion down to 3 billion, down to 1 billion. Because those numbers have been, have been thrown out by other scientists who assess the problem as we have too many people and we will not be able to, the planet will not be able to support that many people for very much longer. Now I'm going to show you four maps. As I said earlier, ocean rise is not a problem. We could retreat from, our cities can retreat from rising oceans. Ocean rise is slow, given the occasional storm like Sandy, which comes and overwhelms New York and is a wake-up call, but the human psyche has a very short memory. A few weeks later, the memories are gone. Unless you lost your house, the memories are gone. And we're doing the same things again. Now the four maps I'm going to show you are drought maps. The first map shows you the drought patterns in the first decade of the century. Now if you look in the desert in Africa, it's yellow and green. That doesn't mean there was a lot of rain. It means there was the normal amount of rain which is dry. So this map shows you the deviation from normal. Is it much wetter? Is it much drier than normal? So I'm going to show you the one-third point, the two-thirds point, and the final decade of this century, and I want you to look at the color change. Here's 2030, 2060, and 2019. The areas in the United States that are going white are off the scale dry. The area around the Mediterranean that is going white is off the scale dry. The Amazon, red to dark red, extremely dry. 
most of the south, southern, and western parts of Africa extremely dry. The normal rain patterns are only prevailing in a very small amount of the surface area of Earth. Unfortunately, a lot of that surface area does not have fertile soil. There are the boreal forests in northern Russia, northern Canada, very thin soils. So you may have normal precipitation, well, normal amounts, not as snow as rain. But you don't have the soil there to grow enough food for 79 billion people. What will kill us is the fact that there won't be enough food to sustain a population. And what happens when there's not enough food? Now, Dr. Natalia Shapova and Igor Semiletov are researchers from the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, and they are predicting a 50 gigaton release of Arctic methane over the next 10 years. Again, this is just a prediction of a couple of scientists, but they go up there and look, as opposed to the scientists who contribute to the ICC, IPCC report, who are modelers. They don't go up there and look. And they say, our models say that the methane will not be coming out for another 100 years. And Dr. Shakova says, well, go look. It's beginning to come out. Now here's what Dr. Peter Wallace is saying from the University of Cambridge, saying about the distinct possibility of that release. And do you think civilization could survive a 50 gigaton release of methane? Um, no, I don't think it can. Um, I think that the if you look at the the, the existing predictions of of global warming rates. Um, what's what's kind of eerie is the fact that uh, the business as usual projections, even even the cautious ones produced by IPCC, are still giving us about four degrees of warming by the end of the century, and uh, with two degrees has been taken arbitrarily as the level beyond which nasty things happen. I, I don't know why it's two degrees, but but that will be reached by the middle of the century and four degrees by the end of the century. Now, f four degrees, people who've calculated what that would do to food production, uh, to uh, die off of forests, to acceleration of warming due to various extra feedbacks that kick in, that the general conclusion is pretty dire that, that if, if, you, if you get to four degrees of warming, then collapse of civilization is, is what's going to happen because the world won't be able to sustain anywhere near its present population. So the result will be chaos and, and warfare. Um, so that's, that's just, the, the eerie thing is that that's predicted by the IPCC uh, report, but the, the projection of warming by the end of the century is four degrees. But nowhere do they state at all that four degrees is a catastrophe for, for uh, economically and so socially for the, for the planet. I won't dwell on that, he said it all. Chaos and boom, or dwindling ability to feed 79 billion people. So, for me, the burning question is, how can we permit this existential risk to be ignored when there is a real threat the collapse of civilization during this century, during your lifetimes. So, I'm going to turn up. I feel we have to make a realization in order to begin to undo the damage that we've done. There is a global operating system for civilization. I'm the only professor I know of who teaches that we have a global operating system. That operating system is seriously flawed. The operating system is known by two names, money and economics. But to call it economics is actually error. It's neoclassical economics. It's a particular brand of economic theory that was cemented in place by wealthy Wall Street bankers in the last century. So when you read the Financial Times in London, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and you read the word economics, 
We are reading about neoclassical economics and its flaw, and we still teach it as if it were perfectly fine. It's also known as growth economics, and that is the problem. From an individual perspective, we cannot see that we've already run out of space for the growth of the human economy. It's estimated that about half of the photosynthesis of the entire Earth has been appropriated by humanity currently. Half of all sunlight falling and generating plant matter, which feeds animal matter, which feeds us, half of it we've already put into our economy. And our economic systems are growing exponentially. How much longer will it take till we totally overrun nature? Now, that operating system is cashing in nature as quickly as it can. That's its program. That's the defect. Grow, grow, grow. Grow your company's earnings year over year. Give an incentive to your CEO if he does it. Fire him if he doesn't do it. All nations have to provide a growing GDP year to year. Oh my God, oh, we're stagnant. Well, it's framed as steady state. We need to aim for a steady state, a balance in nature, a balance with nature. So, neoclassical economics, I'm going to compare it with something called environmental economics, which is a little bit better, but still has big problems, and compare that with ecological economics. Now, neoclassical growth economics is dysfunctional by design. It optimizes the marketplace to maximize profit at the expense of health, ecology, ethics, and all future generations. Neoclassical growth economics makes the fundamental assumption that there are no limits to Earth, that there are no limits to the resources of the Earth, and there are no limits to the waste sinks, the Earth's ability to absorb our toxins. Climate change is just one aspect of our violating Earth's limits and its ability to absorb our CO2 from the exploding use of fossil fuels. We are not even turning the corner yet. We're beginning to slow down on our coal use. That's why I say two degrees is a fantasy. Now, the model in all economics text textbooks looks something like this. This is the macroeconomic model. You have money going from consumers to firms, and you have labor going from people to firms, and then you have money coming back in the form of rents and wages and dividends, stock dividends, and you have all the stuff, services and stuff that we collect in our homes, our garages, our pocketbooks, our cell phone, which we have to replace every year because Apple tries to obsolete it as soon as you walk out of the store. And of course, there's more money accumulating in firms than there is accumulating in the population. And this is because of the design of the economic system. The money accumulates in the banking system and in the large corporations. That's the way it's designed. That's the nature of neoclassical economics. Now, what's missing from this picture? There's no concept of Earth. The Earth is regarded as an externality in macroeconomic textbooks. The human economy exists within this, and it cannot exist without this, and that is not taking account of in any standard economics course that I've attended. There is no prosperity on a planet that's dying. Growth economics is killing the planet. At present, we are trading this for this. I'm trying to get this through to you in many ways, in the words I say, in the pictures I show, in the images, for you to get it and act on it, and I'll come with an action for you at the end of my presentation. So, neoclassical growth economics versus environmental economics. Environmental economics says if you can put a value on nature, everything will work out in the marketplace. Wrong. Japan wants to the exercise of valuing its wetlands. It came up with the figure $16 billion. 
That's chump change to some of the billionaires out there. If they had been for sale for $16 billion, there would be hotels in all of the wetlands of Japan. Again, environmental economics has some flaws. It is the attempt to fit environmental stewardship into the neoclassical economic model, which is flawed to start with. Ecological economics, in my mind, is our only hope of survival. If we could get schools teaching ecological economics, it's called strong sustainability versus the weak sustainability of environmental economics. Now, this gentleman, Dr. Herman Daly, is credited as being the father of ecological economics. He's a World Bank senior economist for six years till he quit in frustration because the World Bank didn't get that all of its funding was destroying nature. Even though they said there's no contradiction between having a growing economy and protecting nature, they didn't get that there was a contradiction. Now, I'm going to close with an intervention, something that you can do. I'm going to ask you if you have a, a laptop or an iPad or a tablet here today, you can do it now before you leave. If not, please write down the, the website, the URL that I'm going to give you and take this action. Now, I taught statistics. In a group this size, if one person, maybe two people, did what I'm going to recommend, I would consider a norm, that's a normal response. If I did a good job, excuse me, I haven't wept on my, my presentations for a while. If I did a good job, a few more than one or two people would do the action that I'm asking. And this is especially important because of the nationality, because you're Chinese, as you'll see. I'm offering you a very quick and very easy way to change the paradigm of society globally. The highest level of change is you can change the paradigm. That changes everyone's behavior. Think of how the cell phone changed all of our behavior, all of civilization, the internet before that, fast food before that. Think of how these things have changed civilization. I'm offering you something that will, to some degree, unknown degree, change civilization. It's a Nobel Peace Prize proposal that I came up with for sustainable development. Now, be careful. The term sustainable development has been co-opted by the neoclassical world economists as well. If you take a look at the UN 17, Sustainability goals, sustainable development goals, they all fit within the neoclassical framework. They all fit within the idea that we can continue to grow our economy. And I question that. Now, this Peace Prize has three nominees. I'm going to go, go through quickly the nominees and why they are nominees. And the first is the Club of Rome. Now, the Club of Rome, in 1972, came out with a book called The Limits to Growth. It was an authoritative scientific study out of MIT that computer models the direction of civilization. And they kept seeing pop human population fail during this century, sometimes radically, sometimes gradually. The only way they could get human population to not collapse was by assuming that we started to deal with climate change and our ecological problems right away. That was 1972, we haven't. They updated it, and 30 years later, this is a very good read. Second, Dr. Herman Daly, for the reason I just proposed, that he has been the father of a system of economics by which we might survive. The difference being, it says that you must start with the notion that ecology and ethics are part of the economic picture. They're not externalities. Unless you bring them inside of your economic theory, then you're, you're really looking for trouble. And finally, Pope Francis. Now, this is not about religion, so get rid of that notion. It's Pope Francis because he is not afraid of telling the truth, and he's a world leader. 
In 2015, he came out with this document called uh, Dr. C, a papal encyclical, and it is completely consistent with ecological economics. I'm going to just read you one quote from it. Given the insatiable and irresponsible growth produced over many decades, we need also to think of containing growth by setting some reasonable limits and even retracing our steps before it's too late. That is why he's the third candidate. There he is, green robes, I call him the green pope. So, you can support this. Anyone can endorse this. Public endorsement. If you go to the website, there's a place to publicly endorse it. Now, there are millions upon millions of qualified nominators for the Peace Prize. You undoubtedly know one or two, maybe more. There are millions upon millions of nominators. If you're studying, undoubtedly some of your professors can nominate for the Peace Prize. I say it's important for you to do it because you're Chinese, because the Nobel Committee in Oslo, if they see a large interest in this Peace Prize, in having the Pope as one of its candidates, one of its nominees, a large interest from Chinese nationals, Chinese citizens, it will raise their, raise their eyebrows. They'll say, ah, now that's global support. Okay. So, that's all I have for you. This is where it starts. Thank you.